There are over 13,000 cards for duelists to create the perfect deck. Many of those cards made their very first appearance in the anime, but for some they would never cross the bridge to the physical card game. Have these cards been lost to time, or are they far too powerful to introduce to today's metagame? The time has come to answer these questions once and for all. Duel Monsters is over. Welcome to the Secrets of Yu-Gi-Oh! GX. Bastion Misawa, the dueling genius, with and without clothing. If I had to describe Bastion's character arc in just one word, it would be disgraceful. As in it was an absolute disgrace how quickly his character was stripped away from the main team after season one. Between his knowledge of dueling, deck building, and overall strive, and I would say success with being one of, if not the most intelligent duelist in all of GX, he remains my favorite character throughout every Yu-Gi-Oh! series. Unfortunately, the writers didn't feel the same way, and Bastion was pushed aside to make room for Chaz's glow-up and the introductions of Jim, Axel, Hasselberry, and Jesse. Don't get me wrong, I like these characters, but none of them quite filled the same role that Bastion did. With that said, it should be no surprise that a fair amount of Bastion's signature cards are still exclusive to the anime, and this week we'll be putting his cards to the test, seeing if in combination with the modern card pool they can solve the equation in creating the perfect deck. Starting with a fan favorite, a new breed of Magnet Warriors. Sadly, they don't really work with the original trio, but would feel right at home with the new and improved Electro Magnet Warriors. Modeled after the OGs, Bastion had his own trio in Magnet Warriors Sigma Plus, Sigma Sigma Minus and Omega Minus, level 4 Earth Rock Monsters, who all share essentially the same effect, differing only on their status as a plus or minus monster. Sigma Plus has 1800 attack and 1500 defense, and cannot declare an attack targeting a plus monster. If your opponent controls a minus monster, this card must attack it if able. Omega Minus has 1900 attack and 800 defense, and Sigma Minus has opposing stats to Sigma Plus. Both of these monsters cannot declare an attack targeting a minus monster, and if your opponent controls a plus monster, this card must attack it if able. The gimmick of Bastion's Magnet Warriors revolves around the real-world function of magnetic polarity, where the same polarities will bounce off one another, and opposing polarities will connect. You all thought that Linear Equation Cannon was a big brain move, but this is next level, so the characteristics of these monsters play very well with our current Magnet Warrior support, being level 4 Earth Rock Monsters. But how are their effects actually applied outside of a Magnet Warrior mirror match? No other monsters are considered as plus or minus, so should these just be vanilla monsters? I won't bore you with the actual process of how magnets are made, but we're basically going to force our opponent to play Magnet Warriors, something I've been preaching for years. Magnet Force Minus is a continuous trap card that when activated can be equipped to any one monster on the field. The equipped monster is treated as a minus monster. Battles between the equipped monster and other minus monsters are negated. If your opponent controls a plus monster, the equipped monster must battle a plus monster if able. We're giving an opponent's monster the shared effect of Sigma and Omega minus, and in turn forcing them to fight with Sigma plus. That may not sound too crazy at first glance, because we don't exactly want our opponent's massive boss monsters to crash into our little magnet warriors. But let's look at another card before we really dive into how this effect works to our benefit. Magnet Force Plus is another continuous trap card that has the same effect as Force Minus, but turns the equipped monster into a clone of Sigma Plus, and can only be equipped to your opponent's monsters. Now that we have both poles firmly grasped, we're ready to conduct our final experiment, the magnum opus of our deck. I'm kind of giving away the next card. Conduction Warrior Linear Magnum Plus Minus is a level 7 Earth Rock effect monster with 2700 attack and 1300 defense. And this card cannot be normal summoned or set. This card can only be special summoned by sending one plus monster and one minus monster from your hand or your side of the field to the graveyard. Very good. This is our Valkyrion of the deck, having almost the exact same summoning condition as the Magna Warrior. It's actually been improved on, only requiring one one of each plus and minus monster, and not all three Magnet Warriors. Hell, it doesn't even require specific names, so this slaps. 
When this card attacks, you can select one face-up plus or minus monster on the field to have this card gain attack equal to half of that monster's attack until the end phase. If your opponent controls a plus monster and or minus monster, this card must attack that monster if able. This is where we capitalize on the effects of our Magnet Force cards. Because Linear Magnum works on both plus and minus monsters, we don't have to rely on having both of the trap cards in play. Typically, a modern boss monster needs 15 and 3 quarter Omni Negate effects and immunity to be relevant. However, most of those same boss monsters are not immune to battle destruction. So, while Linear Magnum may not be the end-all be-all of Bastion's Magnet Warriors, it's still a heavy hitter that can get even heavier, and I think could play a vital role in the end board of modern Magnet Warriors. Another interesting combination is targeting your own non-Magnet Warrior monsters with Magnet Force Minus, which then makes them an appropriate target for Linear Magnum summoning condition. Magnet Force Plus, along with any card or effect that would let us take control of the opponent's equipped monster, could also be used in a similar fashion. The only critique that I have, and I'm more so just nitpicking, is that the summoning condition doesn't tribute the plus and minus monster, because that would allow for the use of a card like Soul Exchange, instead of finding a way to switch control of the equipped monster in the case of Force Plus. Linear Magnum does put a big target on its back though, having no semblance of self-protection or any kind of negation, however this variable was worked into the equation. Power Off is a a quick play spell card and upon activation you must send one face up plus minus monster you control that was special summoned by its own effect to the graveyard. Special summon the monsters used to special summon it from your graveyard. By one face up plus minus monster, that means linear magnum, although I do wonder if that wording was meant to imply that there were supposed to be more plus minus monsters. But Bastion was stripped of any potential, literally and figuratively. This card is great though. It lets us dodge any targeting effects, which is far more than I can say on any support that we have for a Valkyrion or Berserkion, but I would have preferred that it return Linear Magnum to the hand, as the name would imply that we are not completely demagnetizing our boss monster. Worry not. Magnet Conductor Plus is a normal spell card that lets you add one plus monster from your graveyard to your hand. Perfect! Not only can this aid in immediately recovering Linear Magnum, if we found ourselves in a pinch, Conductor can also retrieve Sigma Plus. Strangely, there wasn't any opposing card that could recover the minus monsters, but we at least have this as an option. And the last Magnet Warrior Bastion Edition support card sounds like it's about to do something crazy, but I'll just say it, it's only crazily average. 100,000 Goss is a normal trap card that can only be activated while you control a face-up plus monster and a minus monster, which can be either linear magnum and or an individual plus and minus monster. Change one of your opponent's face-up defense position monsters to attack position, it loses 800 attack. Like I said, average. Realistically, this would probably never see any play. I can't tell you the last time I saw a monster in defense position during a standard format game, let alone face up defense position. Nine times out of ten, the field conditions needed will never be met to make this card live, and I'm not about to play stumbling to make it happen. I can't be too harsh though, every wave of Magnet Warrior support has had a laughably bad card. I mean, have you seen Magnet Reverse? Okay, so I might have spoken too soon because there's one more card, it's... Well, it's a magnet card, sadly. Last Magnet is a normal trap card that can only be activated when an opponent's monster destroys a monster you control by battle. Equip this card to that monster, it loses 800 attack. Words cannot describe the hairs that this effect puts across my ass. Like, where the heck did this come from? Why is the effect only applying after your monster is destroyed? And why can this not be equipped to a monster other than the one that's already attacked? The stat reduction is completely irrelevant. Frankly, there's no point in answering these questions because this card is going to get negated, or you'll lose before you even get the chance to activate it, or we can just ignore these questions because this card shouldn't be found in any deck ever. Even geniuses make mistakes, I guess. I could go on for hours about how much I love nearly all of these anime-exclusive Magnet Warrior cards, but we will literally be here all night, so I'll keep it short. I like them a lot. They work perfectly with the Magnet Warriors that we have. Konami. Print these, or I'm going to be under your bed tonight. Bastion had two more cards, and oh boy, they might as well be Magnet Warrior cards because they are polar opposites in terms of their respective effects viability. Plasma Warrior Etom, the monster we should have gotten instead of Litmus Doom Swordsman, is a level 8 Light Thunder effect monster with blue eye stats. And this card cannot be normal summoned or set. 
This card cannot be special summoned except by tributing one level 7 or higher monster. On a soft once per turn during your main phase, you can have this card's attack until the end phase, and if you do, this card can attack your opponent directly this turn. I really feel like there's something here. The Thunder typing leads me to believe that this would be a fun tech in Thunder Dragons. Maybe not their greatest asset, but where else are you going to play this? Hunters? Well, that doesn't work. Dark Magicians? Closer, but I hate that idea. Let's just stick with Thunder Dragons. And Bastion's final anime exclusive card I actually became quite familiar with when researching Chaz's anime exclusive cards because it was featured in their duel Amorphous Barrier, a counter trap card which can only be activated when an opponent's monster declares an attack while you control three or more monsters. End the battle phase. Bastion, my guy, I can't defend you on this one. This is garbage. It doesn't even fit the bill for a typical GX character battle trap. Having a loose relation to their deck theme and or archetype, but having the exact same result as negate attack. It's just nothing. Th this is nothing. A big, stupid, pink nothing. I, I can't. I just... What the fuck is going on? Surely Bastion's dueling idol would never approve of such an asinine card. One Dr. Eisenstein and his six anime exclusive cards referencing the greatest minds of our time. Honestly, they kind of just make my head hurt. Lapless the Fiend Mathematician is a level 4 Dark Fiend effect monster with 1000 attack and defense. And when this card is removed from the field by any means, inflict 300 damage to your opponent for each card on the field. In name, a likeness to Pierre Simon Lapless, whose one of many noteworthy publications was a 5 volume discourse on celestial mechanics. Fitting, because this effect will send your opponent straight to the stars. No, they won't die, because this is the dub we're talking about. The maximum amount of damage that you could inflict with this card is 6,900 based on all other 23 card zones on the entire field being occupied. How likely is that? Well, the probability is by no means in our favor, but remember that this is a non-once-per-turn effect. So any engine that can consistently recycle this card to then be linked away or returned to the hand could more than likely turn out a pretty ruthless OTK strategy. Kind of reminds me of the OTK centered around Cannon Soldier and the original Firewall Dragon. I still have nightmares. This is just the first piece in the puzzle. Allow me to explain. Battle Constant is a normal spell card that requires you to banish one monster card, continuous spell card, and continuous trap card you control to special summon one brain dragon from your hand or deck. We'll touch on that monster shortly, but now we have an in-theme method of proccing the effect of Lapless. That's what we call synergy. Most of you competitive type probably scoffed at the idea of needing both a continuous spell and trap on the field to banish as requirement. I am almost entirely on your side. However, Eisenstein's cards are well worth their weight to play alongside Battle Constant. Also, it's a non-once-per-turn effect. So if you're really living that rich life and have three of each material and three copies of Constant, I'd probably just scoop if you've managed to keep all of that on the field because your brain is functioning on a much higher plane than I can even even comprehend. Schrodinger's cat. Well, that reference is kind of on the nose, isn't it? But this is one cool cat. It's a continuous spell card, and while face up on the field, when you draw a card outside of your draw phase, you can reveal the drawn cards, then return them to your deck. Then, draw cards equal to the number of returned cards. If you draw a card by this card's effect, you cannot use the effect of Schrodinger's cat. Don't be afraid, they're just over-explaining. In layman's terms, it's a mulligan for your draw cards, and we've all been there. A pot of extravagance that led to two more copies of Pot of Extravagance. Oh, on surface level though, this card fills the same niche as cards like Card Trader, Reload, and Magical Mallet. That's to say, it's not very good, but there's still more merit to the effect than those other similar cards, on top of it being our continuous spell for Battle Constant. The continuous trap requirement is filled by Draw Paradox, and while face up on the field, neither player can conduct their normal draw during their draw phase. During each player's draw phase, their opponent draws one card. It might be a dick move, but it's a funny one. This effect also triggers the ability to use the effect of Schrodinger's Cat. On its own virtue, I'm curious to see what this card's potential would be as a going first staple, blocking your opponent out of their first draw. I don't see it being game warping by any means, as a competent meta deck doesn't tend to live or die by the draw phase, however, I also couldn't say that if faced against those same meta decks with a bricked opening hand, it wouldn't cause that deck to lose. It's just an overall interesting card, with respectable versatility in use outside of being a key player for Battle Constant. Which speaking of, now that we have all of the necessary components to solve this long and drawn out equation, 
By banishing Laplace the Fiend Mathematician, Schrodinger's Cat, and Paradox Draw, we call upon the mighty Brain Dragon! Well, you could have fooled me. I mean, it's definitely a dragon, and I'm sure it has a brain if I had to make an educated guess. But it's a level 8 light dragon effect monster with 2800 attack and 1000 defense. Thankfully, with no summoning clause that strictly ties it to battle constant. During your draw phase, you can draw two more cards in addition to your normal draw, so three in total. Then, place two cards from your hand on top of your deck in any order. That effect sounds... awfully familiar. Brain Dragon is pretty charitable with the extra draws and executes with such grace. It's on the tip of my tongue, but I just can't put my finger on where I've seen that effect before. No amount of scientific, mathematic, or even spiritual argumentation could disprove that this is a stellar effect. Every turn, add the top three cards of my deck to my hand. The only debate to be had with this card is which summoning condition is easier to achieve, a hard tribute summon or special summon with battle constant. I vouch for the latter only due to the benefit of summoning from the deck, although a hard tribute leaves you netting less of a disadvantage. For a group of cards that in no way could be considered a legitimate archetype, the synergy between them puts several actual archetypes to shame. What's it gonna take, Konami? I'll go get my degree from DeVry University right now if that's what it takes to play these cards. Or at least, I, I will, after we cover Dr. Eisenstein's final anime exclusive card. Relativity Field, a field spell card that strangely appears to feature Bastion in the card artwork. It has a lingering effect that each time a player loses life points, all face-up monsters they control lose an equal amount of attack while face-up on the field. I would love to be able to explain what the theory of relativity is and how this card's effect translates it perfectly to Yu-Gi-Oh language. But I don't have a PhD in dueling, and from what I can comprehend of the theory, I'm just gonna say that it's spot on. I'd have to imagine that an effect like this, especially as a non-once per turn, has a ton of potential application in super aggressive OTK strategies. Suddenly, staring at your opponent's full board isn't so scary because they're all getting cut down to size. Hopefully you took some good notes because that was the final card for this week's episode, and you know what that means. It's time for the Purple Pineapple Grading Scale, where I take the total number of cards covered in this week's episode and get a percentage based on the number of cards that I want to see come to the physical game. Anything 70% or above is a passing grade. Of the 18 cards covered in this week's episode, Bastion and Dr. Eisenstein get a 72%, with 13 cards that I think are worthy of a physical print. And I'm happy to say that we officially have our first passing grade of the season. It took 7 episodes, and I promise that my bias for Bastion's cards didn't influence the grading. Then again, all but one Magnet Warrior card got my stamp of approval. All right, all right, all right, settle down. I figured I probably wouldn't be able to get through this video without having to talk about Fire Dragon. Let's talk about Bastion Misawa's Fire Dragon, the elusive monster shown alongside his signature Water Dragon in the opening credits of Yu-Gi-Oh! GX. When the Yu-Gi-Oh! GX series ended and this Fire Dragon monster was never played by Bastion or imported to the physical game, thousands of fans were left wondering with a resounding, What the fuck? What did we miss out on though? We know less than nothing about this monster and any potential effects, so let's start with Water Dragon. A level 8 Water Sea Serpent monster that can only be special summoned by the the effect of the spell card Bonding H2O by tributing two copies of Hydrogedon and one copy of Oxygedon, which represents the chemical symbol of water. Water Dragon decreases the attack points of all fire and pyrotype monsters to zero, and when this card is destroyed by any means and sent to the graveyard, you can special summon the materials used for its summon from the graveyard. I've always imagined that Fire Dragon was meant to be the perfect counterpart to Water Dragon, However, fire isn't a chemical symbol in the same way that water is, but a chemical reaction formulated by the properties of oxygen, fuel, and heat under the perfect circumstances. This reaction is called combustion, so if modeled after water dragon, we can assume that fire dragon could only be summoned by its own unique bonding card, say something along the lines of bonding combustion. But what materials are necessary? Well, oxygen has been covered by virtue of oxygedon, 
The fuel component can be fulfilled by a newer addition to the Dawn Dinosaur Monster series in Carbonetton. Carbonetton resents carbon and its effect is actually a play on carbon's extremely flammable nature. But what about the heat? This is where things get a little dicey, as much as we don't want that variable in science. With the need for a heat component in our reaction to create Fire Dragon, that would imply that in Yu-Gi-Oh! language we need a fire or pyrotype monster. Unfortunately, we don't have a fire attribute Dawn Dinosaur monster, so let's just go the easy route and say that our bonding combustion card requires any one fire monster. With those components put together, the effects of bonding combustion would read as follows. Tribute one Oxygeton, one Carbonetton, and one Fire Monster. Special summon one Fire Dragon from your hand, deck, or graveyard. Maybe even make it a quick play spell card as a cheeky nod to spontaneous combustion, but that covers the new signature bonding card. What about the actual Fire Dragon? Here's what I've decided on. Fire Dragon is a level 8 Fire Pyro monster with 2600 attack and 2800 defense, mirroring the stats of Water Dragon. It carries the same summoning condition as Water Dragon, but requires the use of our Bonding Combustion spell card. Some might say that Fire Dragon should reduce the attack of all water monsters to zero, also as a mirror to Water Dragon, but that wouldn't make any sense. Instead, I've decided that Fire Dragon is unaffected by the effect of Water Dragon. Also, because we're looking at what would have been a GX era effect monster, I can't go ablaze with Omni Negates and Lockdown effects, so I'm playing into its disposition as an actual fire and consuming flammable materials to grow. If this card destroys an opponent's monster in battle, this card gains half the attack of that destroyed monster as a permanent increase. As far as recreating Water Dragon's floating effect, there's a couple different directions that we could go in. We can either have a carbon copy, no pun intended, effect that resummons Oxygeton, Carbonetton, and a fire monster from the graveyard when Fire Dragon is destroyed. Or we can lean further into the fire gimmick, having Fire Dragon extinguish and float into some kind of earth or ash dragon. I'm in favor of the former, only because we decided on requiring a generic fire monster for the initial summon from the bonding combustion card, so Fire Dragon will float into Oxygeton, Carbonetton, and a fire monster in your graveyard. Fire Dragon is probably one of the most infamous anime exclusive cards of all time. Frankly, it doesn't even fit the bill of a typical anime exclusive card because it's really only exclusive to a single scene in the opening credits, but has somehow left a greater legacy than most anime cards from the GX era. Will we ever see this card in the TCG or OCG? It pains me to say that we most likely will not because there are thousands of anime exclusive cards that are already made that Konami can put minimal effort into to import. Yet, they're still non-existent to the physical game. So I'm hard pressed to believe that Konami of both America and Japan have any intention of revisiting Fire Dragon in the next Animation Chronicles. I'd be happy to be proven wrong though. Hey guys, thanks for checking out this week's episode of The Secrets of Yu-Gi-Oh! GX. If you like the video, don't forget to drop a big thumbs up. It's greatly appreciated, as always, guys. And if you're new to the channel, go ahead and hit that subscribe button for me down below. If you missed the previous episodes, you can check them out in the playlist down right here in the bottom right corner. Or if you want to check out Season 1, where we covered every anime-exclusive card from the Duel Monsters era, you can check that out in the playlist right up here. Thanks again, as always, guys, and we'll see you in the next one.